hi guys welcome back to my channel obs and guide made easy in today's video i'm going to discuss abrupt shock placenta also known as placenta abrupt shock it is one of the causes of antepartum hemorrhage remember we discussed causes of antepartum hemorrhage in my video of placenta preview so what is abrupt shock placenta it's defined as the premature separation of a normally implanted placenta before we discuss the pathophysiology of abrupt shock placenta let's remind ourselves of a few basic anatomy here we have the uterus. The inner lining of the uterus is called the endometrium. The middle layer is called the myometrium and the outer layer is called the perimetrium. And what covers the perimetrium is the serous cord. And here we have the placenta with the umbilical cord as well as spiral arteries. The spiral arteries are located in the central part of the placental bed and they come from the uterus, specifically the myometrium. Here we have the placenta implanted into the endometrium, specifically the decidua basalis of the endometrium. So the decidua basalis is located deep in the endometrium and that's where the placenta is implanted in the endometrium of the decidua basalis. And the decidua basalis can proliferate and also invade part of the myometrium. This remaining portion of the endometrium that the placenta does not get implanted into is called the decidio parietalis. Now let's look at the pathophysiology of abrupt shock placenta. Whatever the insult is, the initial problem is that there's bleeding into the decidio basalis here. And that blood collects into a hematoma between the decidio and placenta. The hematoma will start to cause separation and ischemic compression to the placenta. And because of the separation of the placenta, some of the spiral arteries will get ruptured and injury. And this will cause infarction and necrosis of the decidio basalis as well as the placenta. Remember that the spiral arteries supply the decidio basalis as well as the placenta. So that causes more ischemic necrosis on the decidio basalis as well as the placenta. There are two possibilities, either the bleeding will stop and cause no complications or the bleeding will continue and cause more separation and more hemorrhage. Then the blood can escape through the chorion. The chorion is the outer membrane of the amniotic sac. The blood will escape through the chorion and the decidua, then will reach the cervix and present as vaginal bleeding. Or it can be a concealed abrupt placenta. The blood can also reach the amniotic cavity and produce blood stained liquor. The blood can also invade through the layers of the myometrium up to the serous cord. This is known as a cuvalea uterus. If you look at a cuvalea uterus, it has diffuse or patchy discolorations of the purplish color. The color is also known as a port wine color. I'll show you an image of a cuvalea uterus. So this is a patient we did a hysterectomy on because of uh, an atonic uterus and it became a postpartum hemorrhage. So this patient was a 37-year-old. It was a fifth pregnancy, so she was a G5 with multiple gestation and also she was hypertensive. She came in with heavy pervaginal bleeding and she was in shock. So we rushed her into theater and did a caesarean section. The, it was a successful caesarean section, but the uterus was atonic. It was failing to contract, and she lost a lot of blood. So we ended up doing a hysterectomy. So one of the complications of a cuvalea uterus is that the uterus becomes atonic. So in this case, we had to do a hysterectomy. But a cuvalea uterus is not an indication for hysterectomy. In some cases, the uterus will contract and there will be no complication. So if you look at the image here, you find that there's diffused patches. They're more of purplish, or you can say wine color. This part is diffused. Some are patches. And behind the uterus here, there was a lot of diffused discoloration of the uterus. Types of abrupt placenta. There's so many classifications of abrupt placenta, but the most clinically used one is classification by presence or absence of vaginal bleeding. So there's concealed abrupt placenta, which is 20 to 35 percent of the cases. As you can see here, the blood is hidden. It's between the decidua and the placenta. There's no vaginal bleeding. 
In revealed abruptural placenta, it's about 65 to 80% of the cases. This is where you have vaginal bleeding. In mixed abruptural placenta, you can have a concealed abruptural placenta. Blood can still be hidden between the decidue and placenta, but some of it will come out, but it will be minimal. And then you have classification by degree of separation. There's complete abruptual, which is 7% to 10% of the cases, where there's complete separation of the placenta. You can have partial abruptual, which is 90% to 93% of the cases. This is where there's partial separation of the placenta. Classification by side. So remember, this is your amniotic sac, and this is the placenta. And the amniotic sac is made of the amine, which is the inner membrane. The chorion is the outer membrane, which forms a close attachment with the placenta. Subchorionic abruptus is where there's bleeding between the chorion and the placental bed. But if this subchorionic abruptus occurs at the margin of the placenta, it's called a marginal subchorionic abruptus. So in marginal, there's bleeding between the myometrium and the placental membrane known as the chorion. In preplacenta, also known as subamniotic, there's bleeding between the placenta and the amine. In intraplacental, there is bleeding inside the placental cavity, in the intervillous cavity. In retroplacental, there is bleeding between the myometrium and the placenta. So the hemorrhage is hidden behind the placenta. So this information is what I have just described above. And then you have classification by severity. Severity according to the clinical presentation. So there is grade 1 where you have asymptomatic patient but there will be small retroplacental clots noted after delivery. In grade 1, this occurs in 40% of the cases. There is absent or slight per vaginal bleeding. There is an irritable uterus, absent or minimal tenderness of the uterus, and there is no signs of maternal shock or no signs of fetal distress. In grade 2 of abruptual placenta, it occurs in 45% of the cases. There is mild or moderate per vaginal bleeding. There's uterus tenderness and tetany. There's no signs of maternal shock, but signs of fetal distress might be present. In grade 3 of abruptual placenta, it occurs in 15% of the cases and there's severe bleeding. The bleeding might be revealed or concealed. There's a hypertonic tender uterus and it's woody, hardy. There's signs of maternal shock. There might be fetal distress or an intrauterine fetal demise and coagulopathy may be present in about 30% of the cases. Etiology of abruptual placenta. The exact cause of abruptual placenta is not known, but there's been associated risk factors like maternal hypertension. Maternal hypertension like chronic hypertension or preeclampsia. So what happens in hypertension is that there's spasm of the blood vessels, the spasm of the spiral arteries and this results in endothelial damage and the endothelial damage results in rupture of the spiral arteries and the bleeding occurs in the decidua basalis. Increased age and increased parity increases the risk of abruptual placenta by three times, especially in grand multiparous women. In P prom and prom the sudden escape of amniotic fluid. This causes sudden uterine decompression. So what happens is that the space inside the uterus reduces because some of the amniotic fluid has come out. So what does the uterus do? The uterus contracts. So this contraction, this brief contraction can cause detachment of the placenta from the uterus, causing an abruptual placenta. Polyhydraminous as well, when there's sudden escape of fluid after rupture of membranes, this can cause the same syndrome known as sudden uterine decompression. So the mechanism is the same in P-PROM and PROM as well as polyhydraminous. Multiple gestation can cause abruptual placenta after delivery of the first twin. Remember, after delivery of the first twin, there's some sort of decompression in the uterus. The space reduces. So this causes also sudden uterine decompression, and the uterus will contract. Now, remember, when the uterus contracts, it causes detachment of the placenta from the endometrium. So this can cause abruptual placenta. Maternal trauma can occur in cases where they're involved in road traffic accidents or gender-based violence or they were just involved in a fight with a, another woman. The abruptual placenta may occur just right there and then or can take time to occur. So you need to observe them for some period. A short cord can also increase the risk of abruptual placenta, especially during labor. When the fetus is descending through the umbilical cord, it can pull on the placenta. So this can cause separation of the 
placenta. Substance use of cocaine and smoking of cigarettes can also increase the risk of abruptio placenta. Remember that these toxic substances can cause vasoconstriction and vasospasm of the spiral arteries. So this can result in endothelial damage which results in rupture of vessels which results into bleeding into the decidio basalis. It can also cause infarction and necrosis of the spiral arteries as well as the placenta. Uterine fibroids also increase the risk of abruptual placenta, especially if a placenta is implanted directly over a submucosal fibroid. In cases where there's a septed uterus as well, you find that the placenta implants over the septum. So this causes a weak attachment of the placenta and causes easy separation of the placenta. History of abruptual placenta also predisposes patients to abruptual placentas in the next pregnancy. The risk increases by 0.4% to 4%. Thrombophilic disorders, thrombophilic disorders like factor V laden deficiency as well as antiphospholipid syndrome have also been associated to cause abruptual placenta. A sick placenta caused by any medical condition like diabetes mellitus, hypertension, or cardiac disease has also been associated to cause abruptual placenta because of infarction and necrosis of the placenta. Clinical features of abruptual placenta. Remember, abruptual placenta can be concealed or revealed abruptual placenta. So if a patient comes to you, they will come with history of vaginal bleeding or not, abdominal pain, plus or minus backache, plus or minus perceiving fetal movements, plus or minus altered conscious state. They might come in an unconscious state if they're in shock. On examination, the patient might be in shock, the uterus is hard and tender, the height of fundus is larger than the gestational age in a concealed abruptual placenta. There's a hypertonic uterus which does not relax, and there's high frequency contractions, and it can be difficult to palpate for the fetal parts or the fetal heart rate. This is because of a hypertonic uterus which is woody hard. There is obvious pervaginal bleeding or not, depending on if it's concealed or a revealed abruptual placenta. And remember to not do a vagina examination until ultrasound to rule out placenta previa. Differential diagnosis of abruptual placenta you have placenta previa, a ruptured uterus, acute polyhydraminase. Remember, acute polyhydraminase can present with an acute abdomen or acute abdomen like intestinal or appendicular perforation and other differentials are other causes of antepartum hemorrhage like cervicitis, vasa previa and other causes of antepartum hemorrhage. Investigations in abruptual placenta. Remember abruptual placenta is a clinical diagnosis. You can make a diagnosis of abruptual placenta just by the clinical presentation of the patient. Ultrasound plays a minimal role. You only do ultrasound to see where the placenta is located and the fetal well-being as well as the biophysical profile. You do a full blood count and differential count. Remember, you are looking for hemoglobin. Because of bleeding, patient may end up with anemia. And you are also interested in the platelet count. Because of disseminated intravascular coagulation, you can actually have a thrombocytopenia. You do a cross match for whole blood and fresh frozen plasma, and you also do a clotting profile. Remember, one of the complications of abruptual placenta is disseminated intravascular coagulation. So you do a bedside clotting time as well as fibrinogen levels. You do urea and creatinine to check the kidney functions. One of the complications of abruptual placenta is renal failure. Complications of abruptual placenta, there's maternal complications. In maternal complication, you can have hemorrhagic shockers of severe bleeding. And that severe bleeding can result in disseminated intravascular coagulation. And that disseminated intravascular coagulation actually results in increased maternal morbidity and mortality. So once you reach disseminated intravascular coagulation, it can be very difficult to save the life of the patient. Another complication is severe anemia because of continuous bleeding, renal failure because of hemorrhagic failure. You can have ischemic cerebrovascular accident because of hemorrhagic shock. And you can also have a covalent uterus, preterm labor. Remember, abruptual placenta can actually trigger a patient to go into labor. 
in the postpartum period you can have postpartum hemorrhage due to a tonic uterus pph due to a tonic uterus as well as disseminated intravascular coagulation fetal complications include fetal hypoxia remember that there's bleeding so there's reduced blood supply to the fetus so this causes hypoxia and because of this continuous fetal hypoxia it can cause intrauterine fetal demise and also you can have prematurity prematurity in case they go into spontaneous labor or because of immediate delivery remember that abruptio placenta requires immediate deliver either by cesarean section or vaginal delivery and because of fetal hypoxia as well as prematurity this increases perinatal mortality you can also have fetal maternal hemorrhage in fetal maternal hemorrhage this is where there's presence of fetal red blood cells in the maternal circulation and this is in in recess negative patients so this occurs due to the recess isoimmunization Management of abruptual placenta. Remember that abruptual placenta is an emergency obstetric condition. So you admit the patient and make sure they have double intravenous access. You do continuous maternal and fetal monitoring, especially for the maternal blood pressure and the pulse. Remember you are monitoring them in case they go into hemorrhagic shock. You do adequate fluid resuscitation, plus or minus blood transfusion, depending on the blood loss. The aim is to deliver them as soon as possible, but 50% of abruptio placenta cases present in labor. So how do you make a decision if you should take a patient for cesarean section or aim for vaginal delivery? These are the indications for cesarean section in abruptio placenta. Fetal distress. If there is severe bleeding which results in maternal compromise, regardless of the fetal status, you take the patient for cesarean section. If the baby is alive and they're not in advanced labor, a viable fetus which favors extrauterine survival even if there's no fetal hypoxia. And you aim for vaginal delivery in a non-viable fetus, low gestational age, a dead fetus, if the cervix is fully dilated and the pelvis is adequate. You do an active management of that stage of labor and be prepared for postpartum hemorrhage. You give anti D if a mother is recess negative. So this comes to the end of our discussion on abruptual placenta. Thank you and please don't forget to subscribe.